Excellent. Go on. Right, so my name is Jacob Dell, and I am the owner of these three companies. The first one, Magic in the Sky, was founded in 2007, and we primarily do firework displays at theme parks, which I can talk about Six Flags. The others, I'll just say an aquatic park that's located in San Antonio and in Orlando, Florida. And then we also do the Bush Garden parks as well. Even though they're owned by the same people, we can only say Bush Gardens. The production company, primarily we do uh, haunted attractions at theme parks. And then we also have done ride queues and retrofit uh, several Sally uh, dark rides to different themes and so forth. And then I also recently acquired Precocious Pyrotechnics, which is the largest U.S. manufacturer of fireworks. Um, and that's located in Belgrade, Minnesota, kind of out in the middle of nowhere. But uh, currently, we have just a little over 3 million pounds of explosives on hand, and we make fireworks basically around the clock, even in the snow and the cold. But Jake had invited me here to talk kind of about fireworks and how we utilize them at theme parks. And basically, even though most people call it a fireworks show, really what we're looking at um, in most of the parks now is a nighttime spectacular that integrates video mapping, fountains, flame effects, uh, obviously audio soundtrack and, and other special effects. So since there's a, not a ton of us on the call tonight, if people have questions, you want to just jump in and ask questions as I go, that's fine. I know we have question session plan at the end. But I thought I'd start out by just talking a little bit about the manufacturer of fireworks. Um, most of the fireworks used in the United States come from overseas, China being the primary uh, country of import, but also Italy, Taiwan, Japan, and Portugal of all places. Uh, but we actually do make a lot of our fireworks uh, in the United States for our use at theme parks. And one of the critical aspects of that is there is a chemical called perchlorate, which is a sensitivity for um, water systems and aquatic wildlife and so forth. And that's the primary oxidizer used in foreign fireworks. And so all the fireworks we make in the United States are perchlorate free. So we're using nitrocellulose or other compounds to avoid having to use perchlorate, which creates a more environmental friendly uh, composition. But basically this picture here you can see is kind of the meat and potatoes of how a firework works. We have what's called a mortar, which is basically a big tube that uh, we typically use high density polyethylene plastic, but uh, you can also use steel or fiberglass. And the firework shell sits in the bottom of the mortar and is collected with or connected rather with an electric match. And then during the firing of the program, we basically send a 24 volt signal to that electric match and ignites the black powder charge, which is just traditional gunpowder at the bottom. So if you kind of think of an old Civil War cannon, that's kind of the same technology that's still being used here, where we have a big long barrel and we have a ball that contains what you see in the sky. And then below it is a little lift bag of typically 2FA or 3FA black powder. And when the electric match ignites, it ignites the black powder and shoots the firework out, just like you would see an old Civil War cannonball being shot out. Now, if you were to break apart the shell or inside of it, basically, which is just a cardboard tube, you'll see that in the center is typically a break charge or a burst charge that detonates and basically causes the firework to explode in the sky. And then surrounding that are various metallic compositions, and we call them stars just because it looks like a star in the sky. And basically that is just rolled, almost if you can imagine making um, noodles with raw dough where you mix the chemicals up. And we actually use, if you've ever seen a hand cement mixer, we've modified that to, to mix these stars. And so you dump the various chemicals in, they're rotating at a specific speed and we throw uh, grape seeds, which are very, very small as starter cores. And then slowly the chemicals build on that kind of like a layered snow cone. If you've ever seen fireworks change colors in the sky, that's accomplished by having a composition of a certain color, let's say red in the inner core, and then having a spacer primer coat, which is basically a, a black powder, and then a second coat of some other chemical composition. And so as it's burning from the outside in, you can get these color changes or flashes or so forth. So here's actually a cutout of two different uh, firework shells and there's two different styles, the Italian style and the Oriental style. Both of these were developed in the 1500s. An important thing to note here is that the ball shell, the fuse is lit from the bottom. So you'll notice the fire comes down the red line, lights the black uh, powder, and then this timing fuse, which is set to burn at about an inch per second, actually burns through the stars kind of in a straw. And then as it hits the black powder core, the shell explodes. 
the Italians kind of had a different view of it. They actually light the fuse from the top of the canister. And then there's a secondary fuse that comes around and lights the black powder on the bottom. And this actually makes Italian style or canister style shells substantially more dangerous because it's quite possible for the um, timing fuse to be ignited, but for the fire not to pass to the brake charge. And so the shell actually remains in the tube. And then as the timing fuse burns, it actually explodes in the tube. And so if you've watched videos uh, certainly you've seen uh, the fireworks at Magic Kingdom in Florida and you see this kind of big blow up behind the castle. That's almost always the canister Italian style shells. Now the reason that uh, you use canister shells and shows because they're a little more dangerous is the volume of a cylinder is substantially larger, basically uh, about 33% larger than a ball shell of the same caliber. So you can get a lot more stars in the sky and make a lot more spectacular effect. The other thing with a ball shell, obviously it has to be a sphere, so you're limited by the diameter. In the case of a canister, some of the canisters can be five to six times as tall as the diameter of the shell. So we actually have like a 10 inch canister shell that's almost three foot tall. So it's, it's quite a large device that comes out of the tube. Okay, the other important thing to talk about, and uh, I was on a conference with Jake back, I guess it was in November when it was turned Notre Dame into a theme park and they were talking about some of the regulatory agents we have to deal with. This is just a smattering of some of the folks that you have to deal with. Basically, when you think about fireworks, they're entertainment, but the government views them as a, a terrorism threat and an explosive. So we basically have to have control of the product. We call it cradle to grave. So from the inception of it being created until it actually is used in a show, and sometimes the firework doesn't fire or the show's canceled, and then it has to come back into inventory. Uh, but Homeland Security, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco Farms and Explosives, Federal Motor Carrier Safety, Department of Transportation, various state fire marshal agencies, and then um, the NFPA, which is basically a private organization uh, in Bethesda, Maryland, that promulgates rules for the safe production of fireworks shows. Uh, the AFSL is another uh, group that all of our fireworks are manufactured under. It's the American Fireworks Standard Laboratory. It's kind of like the UL listing for electrical products. So all of the fireworks that we manufacture are tested in batch lots. And the AFSL certifies that we've made them in accordance with the chemical restrictions and so forth so that they're both safe to transport and uh, environmentally friendly. The other thing that you probably have seen if you've watched fireworks displays at theme parks is there's a variety of fireworks going on, typically very large aerial fireworks shot somewhere behind the park or outside of the area that normal guests are able to walk. And then there's also proximity fireworks that are typically shot off of buildings, rooftops, or even performers that are very close. And so the um, United Nations has promulgated these different categories. and. I'll just kind of skip over some of these, but the 1.3 category is the large aerial display. And so those would be the fireworks that you see typically going high in the sky. It's important to note that you cannot transport those goods by airplane, which actually causes a lot of logistical issues for firework displays. In the case of Disney, they package all of the shows in Florida and then actually because of storage restrictions in California, ship the Disneyland shows once a week to Anaheim. And they're actually not stored in Anaheim, they're stored outside of the park and then brought in one show at a time. So if you imagine the logistics of, we're gonna shoot a show at Disneyland on Saturday, it had to be packed in Florida, transported all the way across the country, pre-staged and then delivered to the park to be shot. Um, some of the fireworks we manufacture, precocious pyrotechnics go into those displays. I can't talk about that specifically because of some contract things, but Suffice to say, they're typically three months ahead of whenever the show or device would actually be used is when we have to deliver it to them in Florida and then it goes through their supply chain. Um, also, for example, the firework shows they do on the cruise lines are also sourced out of the um, magazine facilities just to the west of the Magic Kingdom. So depending on what company you're dealing with, it's a pretty complex situation just to get the material to where it needs to go for the show. The other category then is 1.4. If you've ever purchased fireworks, if you live in a state where you can purchase fireworks from like a roadside stand or a fireworks tent, they're in the 1.4 category. And there's different letters. And if you looked at the letter of what you purchased, you would have probably just anybody from the public can buy these fireworks. The 1.4S, which is what you would see if you've been to medieval times and you see them shooting fireworks indoors or you see things at wrestling 
events or other indoor items, those are the 1-4-S uh, category. Okay. A couple other things, we'll just kind of picture show and tell. These are some of the things that you could kind of see behind the scenes and something that we always invite folks if you're 21 or older. Uh, and at one of our theme parks, either in Texas or Florida, we'd love to have you come by and see the setup or, or watch the show or even help load the fireworks someday if you'd like to do that. But this is basically what a typical aerial shell looks like. It looks very kind of plain and kind of handmade because they all really are. Uh, as you know, Disney, for example, shoots off of barges. We shoot off of barges at the aquatic park in Orlando. And basically, it's just a floating platform that we mount the firing equipment onto. The other thing that's interesting, if you ever dealt with fireworks on your own, it typically has a green visco fuse. And if you lit it with a cigarette lighter or something, it would burn it about an inch per second. So you can light it and they have plenty of time to run away. In the case of the professional fireworks, timing is critical because we want the firework kind of as an actor in the sky to perform exactly at the right crescendo of the music. And so what this is, is just cotton string that is um, kind of dipped in acetone and then we run back black powder through it. But we also put it inside this little shroud or the um, kind of paper straw, if you will. And the interesting thing about this is as the fire is burning because the gas can't escape because we've contained it in this little paper uh, straw, it actually accelerates and pushes the gas forward, which accelerates the fire. And we can get that to burn at about 30 feet per second. So it burns quite rapidly when we do that. So that allows us to ignite things very rapidly. Obviously that creates a danger because you can see up here, the shell leader, all of this fuse, which is about a foot and a half would burn in you know, 0.01 seconds and it's gone, right? So it's almost instantaneous. That's great for allowing us to fire things, uh, choreography with music and so on, but it prevents a real danger because static, shock, et cetera, can cause that to ignite. The other thing that we do is we gang individual tubes together and I've got a little tube uh, that I could show you guys, but basically if you imagine like a, a paper towel tube or a toilet paper tube, something like that, that's actually the individual mortar for these repeater items. And you can see we can load hundreds and hundreds of these devices at a time and we get these nice sweeping fans rather than having to wire each device individually. We're depending upon the mechanical transfer of fire with the black powder. Uh, here's an up close picture of one of the electronic firing modules. We use Fire One, but there's a variety of softwares that are available. And in essence, you have an electric match, which is shown here, and you'll see there's a little piece of niachrome, and then that's again dipped in acetate and a little bit of black powder primer on it. And so when we apply an electric current, the niachrome heats up just like in a toaster and it ignites the black powder and that's what uh, propagates the fire to the firework. And so when you see a show, basically you have a positive and negative terminal, it's all DC based. And every firework you see go in the sky, somebody had to hand wire that particular lead. So uh, if you've seen live performances and you see like lighting designers, they have to put the light plot together and hook all of the lights up and, and get them all coded, but then they can use that show after show. In the case of fireworks, every performance every night is completely new set of fireworks and somebody has to rehook up all of the cues. Uh, typically, in most of the theme park shows we do, we're looking at 900 to 1,000 cues a night. So we have to have somebody hook up those connections and test all of those. Um, some of the bigger New Year's shows, you're talking in the 16 to 2,400 cues, which is, again, just additional time and labor to, to set all of those things up. The other difficulty is the transportation and the regulation of storage, you can't set up fireworks two weeks in advance and then just wait for the show. All of it has to occur basically within the 24 hours previous to the show going off. So as you have these larger kind of New Year's Eve, 4th of July type of events, we have crews of 20, 30 people to be able to pull that off because it all has to be done in one day. And that typically causes problems if there's poor weather or whatnot. Uh, this picture here kind of shows the inside that's the 2FA lift uh, powder broken off just so you can kind of see it. You'll notice that it's not a lot of explosive material necessary, about two ounces. So you don't have to have a lot of black powder uh, in order to get these things to work. Uh, here's a picture of what some of the tubes might look like. Uh, basically in the United States, everybody goes off of um, empirical systems. So it's by inch. Uh, so a three inch shell, for example, is just a diameter of three inches. Um, in Europe and overseas and so forth, people use millimeters. So you would have a 75 millimeter shell instead of three inches, 100 millimeter instead of four inches and so forth. 
Uh, seven inch is actually very uncommon in the United States. We're one of about three companies that use uh, seven inch material. And really the reason that we do is the safety setback distances. Uh, we can't use eight inch, but we can use seven inch. And so we kind of use that oddball size. So here's a, a, a picture of a Roman candle. If you've ever maybe as a kid had Roman candles, basically what it is is you have an individual shell and then there's some packing and another shell and some packing and another shell. As a kid, the Roman candles you had were probably half inch in diameter or something like that. Most of the candles we use are four or five inch. So it's a much bigger tube and it allows us to shoot a barrage of things up in the air at a, at a time. This particular shell here is one of our um, ball shells. This is an eight inch shell as an example. And you see all of these little pellets are actually the stars that would burn and produce the color effect. Now you can't tell from this, but this turns out to be a gold tremolon shell. So it would burn in a nice gold flittery color. But all of the firework compositions are metals. And of course, as we know, most powdered metals are either going to look silvery metallic or white in nature. And so you really can't tell the shell color by looking at it. Another kind of crazy thing is if you see pattern shells, for example, we have a rainbow pattern shell where you see the red on the outside ring and then the next ring orange and so forth. Somebody has to actually hot glue or hot melt each of these individual items into the shell so that it bursts in that pattern if you see smiley faces or different colored patterns. And so particularly at Disney World, they started to use some uh, Japanese young fung shells in their um, latest production. If you are able to watch that on YouTube. You can see right before the Mulan section starts, there's a beautiful 10 inch shell that they shoot off that has colored petals radiating in six different quadrants. And that shell is taking their technicians over a week to build because they have to paste each of those individual colors. Um, it's a, a very beautiful shell if you get a chance to look at that. So the other thing here, I'm gonna just kind of gloss over this, but again, we're gonna share the PowerPoint with Jake and he can get that to you. One of the other big things when designing a show is to figure out what emotion you wanna create with a particular musical piece. And so some pieces of music are bombastic and high energy, and then other pieces are more uh, melodic and soft and kind of trying to draw emotion out of folks. And so even though we're basically doing the same thing, taking a, a bomb, putting it on top of black powder and shooting it to the air, as we adjust things such as break speed and the amount of break powder, we can have a very soft, gentle break or we can have a very bombastic hard break. In the case of shape shells where you might see smiley faces or cubes or so forth, those are broke the hardest because we have to have the stars almost immediately get into their position or their maximum velocity out of the shell. And so those are broke very hard. If you've seen the very beautiful kind of gold willowy effect that kind of slowly draws us down, those have almost no break charge at all. So these are all of the different effects kind of in the toolkit that we pull from. And as we're thinking about the certain movement of the song as a designer, you start to think about what look you want and you can pick from these variety of effects. And then you marry that with color and the possibility of color change or strobe and so forth. And you really have a pretty good palette of things to work with. Uh, another thing that uh, fireworks provide is an audible component. So it's not just the look of it, but it's also the sound. And so we have whistles and humming and serpents and bzzz, buzzing type noises. And depending on what you want to do with that, that has to be offset in time as well. Because of course, light travels fast enough that as the firework goes off, we, we instantly see it, but sound is very slow. And so if I'm going to shoot a firework that I want to make a noise that goes with the soundtrack, I have to pre-delay that. Typically, we use about 300 feet per second as a delay mechanism. And so if I'm shooting, let's say, behind the castle at Disney World, I'm over 1,200 feet away. So I have to delay basically a second and a half before the audience will hear that sound. And so I have to take that into account and pre-fire audible effects in order to make that work. So the next step is to really figure out let's say I'm going to a new park and I'm saying, all right, we're going to do a nighttime spectacular. The question is, what can we safely shoot? And there's really two views of a layout. The first is that the spectators are located kind of in some set zone and I know where the wind is going and so I can have kind of a layout. This is typical if you've seen uh, the Fantasmic shows, if you've seen the shows at the aquatic park that we do, uh, Six Flags in San Antonio, the audience is in one position and everybody's looking in the same direction and the fireworks are all at the same viewpoint. In other cases, if you've been to like Epcot, for example, you can really stand anywhere you want around the lagoon and the fireworks are viewed in a 360 format. And so there it becomes a little more 
gutsy as far as the wind because the wind can change directions and it really doesn't matter where the audience is it's always going to be blowing somewhere towards the audience because the audience is virtually surrounding the fireworks so a lot of math goes into this and i know some of us are into the engineering part but basically we have determined as an industry and we actually do some of this testing based on the size shell on an and these are ball shells by the way canister shells behave quite differently actually what is the velocity that those shells would reach? And then we determine based on certain offset angling, how far could that shell travel towards the audience before it would detonate? And the interesting thing is fireworks are somewhat slow in retrospect to other types of items, but you can see they're still traveling at several hundred feet per second, which is pretty speedy, all right? Because of this, the offset angle, this is the trajectory, how many feet in the air, you'll notice that larger shells at basically a 15 degree, 75 degrees, 90 degrees is basically vertical, if you will. So we're 15 degrees to the, to the left or the right. You'll notice that even a small shell, a three inch shell can travel 200 feet sideways before it reaches its destination. And the interesting problem with this is as wind is blowing, typically anywhere above 10 miles an hour, it can actually shift the entire fireworks display three times this recommended safety distance, right? So if you've ever been at a theme park and you see a bunch of paper, or maybe you start feeling paper dropping down on you during the fireworks show, it's because the wind has carried all of this debris that far. And 15, 20 years ago, nobody cared about paper coming into the audience. Today, it's a, a tragedy. If there's a single piece of paper, there's safety people everywhere, pictures, it's, it's a big disaster. So really that's caused us to do two things. We've changed the way we manufacture shells so that there's less debris. Uh, we've used all kinds of tricks to try and minimize the amount of stuff that can come down. Uh, sometimes they're actually using chemical adhesives or chemical tapes that burn up as they're going up. Cellulose has been a big part of that. But that's a major challenge in figuring out the design. The other thing then is once the shell reaches whatever distance off center it's, it's gotten because of the wind and so forth, then the question is how big of an explosion will we have? And in the case of small shells, two inch shells, three inch shells, you're talking 100, 150 feet. As you get to some of the bigger shells though, it can take on three, 400 feet. So if you're kind of keeping track of this, we're now well over a thousand feet into the audience from where that firework was initially launched. Uh, this is a slide that we share with our customers when we're talking about what to expect. And you'll notice that it, it starts to take on somewhat of an exponential curve. It's not a linear effect. As the shells get bigger, we have less and less situation. But the top number is basically how wide of a circle do we have from a diameter standpoint. And then the second number listed or the bottom number is how tall in the sky it'll go. And that actually is a pretty critical thing. And we get into some geometry situation. Typically, we use a five foot two person as kind of eye level as our general customer. So wherever you're going to be viewing the fireworks from, if people are standing, you set a, a line at five foot two off the ground, and then you start doing geometry to figure out where can people see. Typically, we do about a 15 degree view to horizon. So if you want fireworks to appear like they're going over the castle at Disneyland, for example, which is very small, only about 88 feet tall, but the fact that you're shooting all the way back from the road, you have to get them quite high. And so actually, we can overlift certain shells or underlift certain shells by adjusting the amount of lift powder. And that kind of is a factor based upon what the shoot site is. So at Disneyland, for example, they launch them much higher than you would see in a typical display. At Six Flags Fiesta Texas, they're actually underlifted because we're shooting off of the top of a cliff wall. So the audience is already about 120 feet below us. And so we will actually underlift them so that the fireworks don't go too high and people have to look up and kind of strain their neck as they're going. So the only sites that I'm able to share with you are the Six Flags sites because they are open to me sharing with you. Some of the other sites I can't share, but this happens to be the park in San Antonio, Six Flags Fiesta, Texas. And basically, if you've ever been to this park, it's uh, an old Opryland park and they have this large grassy area here. And that's where we uh, have the main audience located at. And then up on top of this cliff wall, basically the park was built in an old rock quarry. We're on top of the cliff wall, about 110 feet elevated from the audience. And this big red circle is our safety zone as far as the large aerial shells. And then down below, 
uh, we've built uh, a bridge to support a flame effects and a fountain and so forth. And we have a lot of proximate materials similar to what you might see coming off of the castle at the Disney parks. The other consideration though, is at this particular park in the summertime, the wind is almost blowing in this direction, kind of in this back behind the scenes area. And so as a consideration, if the fireworks show is like at nine o'clock, there's a whole sequence that the park has to go through to start shutting down rides ahead of time. And that creates kind of a customer service issue because you have to advertise these rides are closing at seven or eight and customers get upset because I don't care about the fireworks show. I want to ride this roller coaster or whatever. And my life's ending because I didn't get to ride it five times a day or whatever. But then the other issue is maintenance people and park staff are also at risk of being injured during the fireworks show, right? It's not just park guests. So once we clear all of these areas out of park guests, then we have to go in and clear it out of all of the park employees. And there's all kinds of considerations to, to think about. There's a lot of food retail in these areas. And so some of them are shutting down the food service areas and that creates problems with them getting the grease traps and so forth covered in time because that presents a flammable situation. And then there's also cash control considerations because we have a lot of cash trapped at certain areas of the park that the park um, security team can't move during the fireworks show. And so they have to staff extra security at certain times. It can be a decent amount of cash that the park has in some of these locations. So all of those things have to be thought about. And then of course, the question is what if the show goes under technical delay or weather delay or ultimately has to be canceled and how do we handle all of that? So all of those things are kind of in consideration and we typically have a park com meeting at 4 p.m. at most of the parks that we deal with. Sometimes it's as late as six to review the weather plan, the wind projections, all of these kind of things and determine what the situation will be for the show. At certain times they'll elect to cancel the show early and announce that over the BGM system of the park. So people pre-know that the show is going to be canceled. Typically though, most parks we work with will do anything possible to get the show off. Even if the weather is, even if it's raining, even if it's bad weather, they still want to fire the show because a lot of the guests have kind of come to expect that. And that's a big deal for them to be able to experience the nighttime spectacular. This particular site is another Six Flags Park. This is Six Flags over Dallas, one of the original Six Flags Park, I guess. And if you're familiar with that park, they have a large kind of elevator observation tower that they call the oil derrick. And uh, we've retrofitted special holders and things. And so we actually take all the fireworks up on the elevator. Um, that's the observation deck and fire the show off of the observation deck. So in that case, the park has the observation deck open to the public till about 7 p.m. They shut the ride down to the public. We come on with these special rolly carts and things that we've designed and basically lift the whole show that's preloaded. All the show is preloaded on these carts, kind of large road cases, if you would imagine. Um, we ferry them up the elevator, hook everything up and then shoot the program and then kind of reverse the process. And that actually turned out to be kind of a technical problem for us uh, because we have very little time and it's basically the shoot site's a public space. And so once the fireworks show is over, it goes back to being a public space the next morning. And so there were quite a few things we had to work through with our um, fire marshals and various representatives of the park to make sure that we could keep that a safe situation. Another challenge with this shoot site is you'll see that the interstate I-30 is out here and that creates a problem. A lot of the parks were originally built in the middle of nowhere, so to speak. And as the years have rolled by, basically in this case, 60 years later, you have a major interstate basically right outside the shoot site. And that creates a lot of problems because traffic, people stop on the freeway to watch the fireworks show and accidents and so and so forth. Okay, the other area then is how do we actually do this? In the old days, people would use a road flare. So if you've ever had a car and maybe you have a safety flare, you see police officers put the red road flares down on the road. That's exactly how the shows were lit. Um, when Disneyland first started, actually, it's kind of funny, the guy that shot Disneyland show for years, his real name was Mickey, but he shot everything with the road flare. So they would have the soundtrack playing on super loud speakers and they would run around with cues, a team of them and touch the road flare to the firework and off it would go. And that's a very exciting way to do things, but it's very dangerous, number one. And it's very difficult to coordinate a great spectacle because each firework is being lit by hand, right? Again, there's various companies that produce this equipment, but we use Fire One equipment, but basically it has four components. So the first component are the control panels. And basically this is just a microprocessor. You'll see these little pairs of studs on the top of the panel. That's the negative and positive output 
um, it's 24 volt DC. And it's basically like in your in your car now, it's signal over DC. So you have 24 volt DC to power the capacitors that allow the electric match to fire. But we also have at basically 0.1 volt, the digital signal being sent over the same 24 volt wire. So it's signal over voltage, which is kind of a cool situation. Previous to this, there was a system called Pyro Digital that used five pin, basically microphone cables, and they would switch the negative to allow a signal to get up, basically DMX type technology to get uh, voltage and 256 cues. And so that was the big kind of limiting factor. Uh, Disneyland in 2005 went upgraded and kind of went to this system. And for the first time you could do more than 256 firework cues per system. Up until that point, that was the limit, right? Which I know 2005 seems like forever ago, but that's pretty amazing that we went that far. Basically with these systems, it's unlimited. You can shoot as many cues as you want. You just keep adding more and more equipment. So the second component then is the, some people call these slats or rails or cue boards, but basically you can see there's positive and negative terminals and every firework that you want to go off has to be hooked to a specific cue. And so the way this works, is basically serial communication. Each of these modules receives a number from one to 99, and then it hooks to one of these output boards that has 32 cues. So if I want the firework hooked to module 10, Q4 to go off, that's what the computer sends a signal to, find the module, find the queue, and then at the specific time, it will fire the queue. Basically, in order to expand beyond the 99 modules, we use a hundreds digit to represent what panel it's hooked to. So this could be the number one panel, number two panel, number three panel, and then in essence, I have module 199, 299, 399, and I can expand uh, that way. And then the last component is time code. And that's probably the most critical uh, piece of this. In a park setting, you typically have some kind of BGM or background music system. Then we typically have a main show audio system that maybe line arrays or some kind of high power uh, digital audio system. Surround sound typically is what's being used now. And then we have moving lights and video and fountains and flame effects and all these other things. And all of those systems have to be synced so that the fireworks show is coordinated across various viewing zones. And as I mentioned before, obviously light travels extremely fast, so the fireworks can be seen instantly, but audio is very slow. And so we actually uh, at the parks have to calculate the sound delay. And so we have different zones. So if you're standing, let's just go back to the Disney parks because people are most familiar with those probably. If you're right in front of the castle, the delay is zero. But if you're in frontier land or outside by the train station or something, the delay actually is increased so that you still see the fireworks going off in time to the music. And this creates a lot of problems because there's certain areas where you have zones that mingle with each other and you get kind of a wah, wah, wah type of sound effect that's very frustrating. So there's a lot of work into that. Uh, the other thing, of course, is the video systems typically use SMPTE. The fireworks uses an old World War II protocol called FSK or frequency shift key. Um, flame systems use DMX. So there's all these different uh, protocols in place and we have to kind of merge all of those together, which sometimes be, proves a little difficult, so to speak. So basically once we've thought about all that, we've decided this is the size of fireworks we can safely shoot. This is where the audience will be viewing all of those things. Then we actually get to the creative part, which is the most fun in my opinion. And that's to work with the park. Sometimes they hire us to do the creative. Sometimes they have other people internal or they hire external production companies, whatever. And we decide what is this show going to be? Is it a Christmas show, a summer party show? Is it a IP show based on some kind of property that we own and so forth? And we kind of have developed this process that works pretty well for us. And that really is getting to that initial meeting to decide what is the story of fireworks going to be. One of the things that I will say Disney did at Disneyland in 2005 was elevate fireworks from just playing music with fireworks to an actual nighttime spectacular. And really, since that point, anybody that's doing fireworks at a theme park, it's no longer acceptable just to shoot fireworks off and have music playing. It has to be a totally produced multimedia experience. And so quite a bit of time is spent on that. The um, Ignite show that we do at the aquatic theme park in Orlando uh, was actually produced over a period of about nine months. So they we brought an orchestra to do the soundtrack, all this complicated stuff. And all of that has to take place before the fireworks can actually be produced and then loaded, right? So there's quite a bit of lead time. 
Uh, custom fireworks typically take somewhere between five to six months in the pipeline from decision of order until it's manufactured, tested, and available for delivery. So there's quite a bit of prep time that goes into that. Um, and so there's a revision process and more revision process. And then once it actually gets into the park, we want to do a test. And that's probably the most stressful point is the whole show is loaded. We do it typically, let's say we're going to open the show on Memorial Day or something like that for most of the regional parks. Typically a week before, 10 days before, we'll do a full test run with all of the live product being fired and all of the effects and so forth. And we'll typically try and videotape that with high speed cameras that are taking 60 or 120 frames per second and actually go back and look at that because even though we have a pretty good idea of the timing of the fireworks, it's always off because it's a manually made device. And so we'll actually sit back and slow-mo the tape and, and move things 0.1 seconds this way, 0.2 seconds that way and so forth to try and line everything up. And then of course, we're ready for the show. And here's just some clips of some Again, I'm able to show you the Six Flags parks, but you can see again, the audience is sitting on this little grassy hill and we're shooting the stuff up from on top of the cliff. And remember I talked about the cake device where there's multiple tubes. That's an example of these. So it's shooting all of these off basically simultaneously. If you had really high speed camera, you could see that it actually fires it in a fan, not instantaneous, but most of the time your eyes perceive it as an instantaneous. Here's one of the water fountains that we installed. Um, that actually proved to be kind of a new area for us. Um, water dynamics are pretty interesting to work with and underwater lights and so forth. Here's some more pictures. Flame effects is another big thing that people are into. Um, those particular effects are made for us in Korea. And then we use Isopar G, which is made by ExxonMobil. It's basically a naphtha fuel with uh, a wax coating on it so it lowers the burn temperature to about 120 degrees. Some more pictures. Okay, this is a picture of that mystery aquatic park in Orlando that I can't tell you who it is, but uh, this is their Ignite show. We shoot it off of the island. And again, you'll see this uh, provides a pretty spectacular photograph, but it's all uh, very close to the audience in that case. And so the maximum size shell that we're able to use there is two inch. So a lot of times people think huge eight, 10 inch shells are necessary to put on a decent show. But in the case of the park in Orlando, uh, two inches, the maximum size that we're able to do. Uh, here's an example of Bush Gardens of, of one of the shows we do. Uh, actually, you can see here the Shikra coaster is still running. That's one of the other challenges. The park, once we lay out that safety pattern, operations in the case of Bush Gardens Tampa came back to us and said, you're closing too much stuff. We're losing too much capacity. We have to keep these rides open. And so that necessitated us shrinking the footprint of the fireworks show and changing some of the launch positions. Uh, actually, some of these fireworks are launched behind the gorilla enclosure house, which kind of created an interesting situation for us because we have to go through an animal enclosure to get to the spot to load them. So we have to work with the zoo people there and so forth. So a lot of fun things can happen in a theme park. The other thing that I wanted to show you just briefly is the software as to how we might go about programming this. Let me just pull this up real quick. So I don't know if you can see that or not. So this is basically the software that we use to program the show. So I have, this is from the Halloween show that we did. So this is basically the audio file up here and you can see a lot of different things, but over here, we basically have the list of products. So these are the fireworks that we've determined we want to put into the show and we have a bunch of different categories that we can pull from. And then basically over here is the programming situation. So once I decide that I want a firework to go off at a particular time in the show, a certain crescendo or a certain moment in the show, that would be what we refer to as the bur uh, burst time, if I can say it correctly. But one of the problems with fireworks is I have to launch it. It takes time for it to get to the sky and then explode. And so over time, we've developed a catalog of what is that lift to break delay. So how long from the time the system fires it in the tube until it actually performs in the sky. And so we program that in. And so basically we have to do a lot of subtraction to say, I want it to occur at one minute into the show, but it takes two seconds to get there. So I actually have to launch it at 58, 58 seconds in the show. The other thing then, and I'll try and drag this screen over if we can see it. Get stuff away here. 
is we kind of lay out the show and this is kind of an old Atari type system, so it's not super high def, but each of these situations represents a position within the layout that we're going to be firing from. So we just don't fire everything from one central location. In the case of mines and comets, we want a big chase across the front edge. So we want things to chase from left to right or whatever. We have to position those. And then as part of the modulization process, the computer sorts it. And then sometimes we have to manually override that so that we can say, where is this firework firing from? Because oftentimes we want maybe five things to go off at once from different positions. And so we program that in. I don't know if this is gonna work. We'll just try and see. But once you've got all that done, then it'll do a little simulation. We'll see if it'll play. This is from, I don't know if we read Phantom of the Opera was it the thing. So you'll see, it starts to simulate what the fireworks are doing. I don't know if that's coming through or not with the situation. So basically you'd go through that process until you get the whole show programmed and then, yay, we're ready to go. And that's really when the work of preparing the show starts. And that's kind of the last piece is how do we actually accomplish this from an operational standpoint? And again, you're under a tremendous amount of pressure because you basically have to do it in one day, right? So oftentimes we'll arrive at the park 7.30, 8 a.m. with team A and they have the show prepackaged, which I guess I should start a little earlier than that. Once the script is produced, we have a thing that says, I want five red fireworks, two blue fireworks, a green firework, et cetera. And so we have people in the warehouse that are pulling all of these fireworks out of our inventory. And the difficulty with that, if you've ever done inventory is people make mistakes and they pull the wrong thing and so forth. And so we've spent a lot of time trying to develop systems that prevent mistakes because the federal government regulates us for precise inventory and they show up randomly, typically once a month on whatever day they choose and say, we want to count X. And then they go out and count stuff. And if something's missing or wrong, it's A, federal penalties and fines and things, but B, it's a big panic because now fireworks are missing and somebody who has the fireworks, right? Most of the time it's inventory error. But so we have to be very precise on that. So basically the show is loaded. We transport it to the park in question and show prep boxes. Typically an average show would have between 10 and 20 boxes of fireworks. Uh, most of those are kind of like moving size boxes. So you'd imagine like a 14 foot trailer full of material. Typically we shoot between 1200 and 1500 pounds of fireworks per show on an average size show. So that's delivered to the parks, typically a week in advance and to a, a storage facility or a magazine. So the team would arrive at 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, pull that particular day's show boxes, and then transport that to the shoot site. In the case of some of the theme parks, we might have shoot sites that are located on rooftops in the park or islands in the park, floating um, pontoon barges in lakes that are in the park and so forth. All of those things have to be loaded before guests access it, or we have to have a way to get people behind the scenes with the fireworks. We can never transport fireworks through the park in front of park guests, if you will, because it's against the law to do so. So you can imagine at the Disney parks, you see fireworks going off of the castle and so forth. All of that stuff has to be in position before guests are able to walk around, which again, kind of creates this morning shift situation. Typically it takes us between nine to 11 hours to load a fireworks show. And typically we're using a crew of six to eight people. Again, it kind of depends on the, on the show. Somewhere in the afternoon then around five, six o'clock at night, we'll do a communications test, which basically, remember I said that we send 24 volts to get the fireworks to go off. We basically send half a volt DC to each of the circuits to prove if the firework is hooked up or not. And so, that testing process is somewhat laborious because let's say we have a thousand fireworks hooked up. We run the test. We find out we're missing fireworks on module 10. Q4 is not working. So a technician has to go out and find out is the firework not hooked up correctly? Is the electric match bad? Is there some kind of problem? Come back in, retest. And it's kind of this back and forth game. Typically that takes about an hour to do. So we're now sitting maybe seven o'clock, two hours before showtime. And we start to go through the show go, no go, um, kind of checklist, checking with the airport to make sure that there's no special flyover situation that we can't shoot the show, checking with the park for weather situations and so forth. And that really rolls right up until the pre-show starts, depending on if it's a multimedia experience or just a park show. Typically, we have maybe a 15-minute pre-roll where the time code and everything is actually 
started 15 minutes before the show actually starts. Uh, and we have kill points all the way up until the show starts. But let's assume we get through all that. Now the show's firing. Even during the show, we have certain parameters as far as debris falling into the audience, malfunctioning fireworks, etc. And there's kill points during the show that we would have to take. Sometimes we can peel off certain effects and continue to do the show. Other times the entire show has to be stopped. And I'm sure you've seen plenty of YouTube videos of parks where the show gets canceled mid show and everybody's embarrassed and it's the kind of this nightmare scenario. But at the end of the day, safety is the key factor for all of this. And sometimes that's the only way to go is to kill the show. And as a consequence of that, we have a whole deck of scenarios from a multimedia standpoint, if the show gets canceled or we have to have reduced fireworks or whatever the situation might be so that that's communicated through the park audio and the programs modified. We actually, at certain parks, have kind of a choose your own adventure show where our show control can cancel certain modules of the show that maybe have higher risk product. And so the show that would typically be 12 minutes rolls down to an eight minute show and you just miss certain sections of the show. So that's basically the process. I don't know how long we've been talking, probably longer than you wanted. Oh, a decent amount of time. Anybody have questions? Yeah, first I just wanna say thank you, Mr. Dell. That was incredible. Thank you, Jake. A lot of really informational stuff. Um, the first question um, in the chat, Jessica was just asking, what is this uh, program here that you're using called? This is called ShowSim, ShowSim. There's another, show, uh, another um, deal called Finale fireworks that also works equally well and it's more of a professional software i assume that's correct yeah the the unfortunate thing about the fireworks industry there's not a lot of us doing it so most of these programs the seat license is kind of like cad it's like 2500 bucks or three grand something like that so it's kind of spendy but it's because they're only going to sell it to 100 people or something you know thanks uh any other questions from you all in the crowd here. Question. Go for it. Um, first, I just want to read early. Jake said, "Thank you so much for telling us." There was like so much information in that presentation. It was all really cool. Um, you mentioned earlier in the presentation having zones that overlap, creating audio problems. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what goes into determining the zones besides distance, or is there something overlapping in distance that causes problems? Yeah, so there's really a couple of issues. The biggest one is most of these parks were built 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and so forth. And so the initial park sound systems that were put in didn't contemplate digital audio, didn't contemplate a lot of things. And I will say Disney does sound incredibly well. If you've ever been to their parks, the little windows on Main Street roll up, the speakers roll out, right? It's super cool. But at some of the more regional parks, it's a much more difficult challenge, right? And so Basically, they will layer new speakers into the park and have that planned really nicely. But then there's the legacy systems that may not be tied into the same system, but they're still wanting to broadcast the audio over those systems. And so one of the things that we quite honestly do is walk around the park testing this and we'll sometimes just unplug speakers, believe it or not, as a kind of a quiet little trick to get rid of the problem. Because it's very disorienting in my mind to be watching a show and having kind of this wah, wah, wah type of effect going on. So I, I'm not an audio person. We do have audio people on the team, but in today's world, it's amazing what people can do with audio. I mean, with crossfade and delay, it's absolutely amazing. The problem is a lot of the technology in some of the parks is pre-digital and therefore you have a lot of these problems that you just have to kind of deal with in a more mechanical sense, I guess. Uh, so it's speakers or lack of speakers creating the conflicting zone, not the, not the firework sounds. That's exactly correct, yeah. Okay. Awesome, thank you so much. No problem. It looks like we have another question from the chat. I'll just read it out loud. Okay. Uh, but Jessica's asking, what's your favorite firework to work with slash your favorite firework period? <laughs> well, I probably have two. The first favorite that's kind of an audible effect is called a Lampari. And it's a six inch or five inch cylinder where we put uh, diesel fuel and jet A fuel and then a one pound aluminum salute. So basically it goes up and goes bang, really super loud bang, and it creates a huge fireball in the sky. But my other favorite firework is the gold willow, which is the really beautiful, pretty pixie dust type of willow. I think that's kind of the iconic firework for me, the Tinkerbell dust looking one. It is a classic. Other questions from 
the folks here. I did just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. This was really, really interesting. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm going to jump in with a question then. You had mentioned, uh, you know, this whole situation with the, I think it was 1.4 fireworks or something that can't be transported over um, airplane. Mm -hmm. But you also mentioned a lot of these fireworks coming from overseas. So are all of these shipped on, you know, like boats, like barges that are coming overseas then? And does that like long lead time affect sort of that production line sometimes? Yeah, that's, that's actually a great question. All the fireworks imported to the U.S. with the exception of certain very specialized items from Portugal come on shipping containers. So 40 foot or 45 foot high cube shipping containers. And Maersk is the only shipping line that will haul fireworks. So it's kind of a monopolistic situation. So basically any firework that I'm going to shoot this year, well, we've had kind of the pandemic thing. Typically any firework I would shoot in the current year would have been manufactured and shipped to me a year ago. So the lead time is between 12 and 14 months. So whatever fireworks I'm shooting now, I ordered and were made over a year ago, which is kind of a big problem, right? Because you have to do a lot of planning in order to do that. And that's one of the biggest challenges in this supply chain is some of the creative people at a park are like, we'd love to have X firework. And it's like, well, that's a year away, you know, and it's hard for people to get that because we live in a world where I order something on Amazon, it's here in two hours type of thing, right? But the fireworks game is very, very slow lead time. And that's really why we integrated with the American manufacturer in uh, Minnesota, because we're able to make stuff and get it maybe now in five, six weeks. The problem is we just can't produce the volume in the U.S. because there's the regulations that exist in the U.S. surrounding explosives make it almost impossible to produce on scale. And then the other question I have is sort of along that line. So it's twofold, I guess. The one is you mentioned, you know, you may have a dud firework that doesn't launch off and you're saying like you have to take it to its grave, right? So my question is sort of what does the grave look like for those, you know, failed fireworks that you know, didn't explode? But also, um, is there sort of a shelf life to the ones that, you know, you brought in a year ago, you ended up not using it in that year? Is there an expiration date or sort? And how do you deal with you know, fireworks that have just been on the shelf for too long and taking them to the grave as well? Yeah, that's a great question, or a couple of questions. So basically the disposal method, as a manufacturer, we dispose, there's hazardous materials disposal companies, there's three of us in the US, but basically we have to incinerate it in a very specialized process. And you can imagine it's kind of dangerous because when it is burnt, it wants to explode. So that's kind of a process. Um, Typically what we'll do though is try and reuse it, right? So if it, if it doesn't fire due to electronic failure because we disabled it in the show or whatever, we'll typically try and roll it into the inventory for the next round of shows to try and dispose of it. They do definitely have a shelf life. There's an argument in the industry on that. We personally use three year shelf life. Some people say five years, but fireworks do not age well. As they, um, longer they sit on the shelf, the more problems we have with, and if you've ever been in chemistry, you know that things crystallize because we have solvents involved in metal solvents basically. And so as those things start to crystallize or sweat, sometimes people call it, it becomes unstable and they can actually self-degrade, you know, after a period of years. So old fireworks are definitely not good fireworks. That's for sure. Thank you for the answers. Any last questions before we wrap up here? Well, I'd like to say thank you to having me here. And again, if you're in San Antonio, Dallas, Tampa, Orlando, one of these places and want to come see the fireworks show, let us know. We'd love to have you. Awesome. Thank you so much for the offer and thanks for the, the great talk tonight. Um, let's give them one more round of applause here before finishing up. Thank you, Jerry. And then you said you'll share this PowerPoint with me as well. Yeah, I'll email it to you. Yeah. No problem. We'll email it out to, to the folks here. And uh, yeah, excited to read up on some of the slides that we went a little quick on. So thank you. Thanks, Jake. Appreciate it. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Thank, thank you so, you so much. much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Have a good night, y'all. See you around.